ones are more with lights went out when death claimed its victory the king and law given all his life the darkest day in history they're on the cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atone won't find breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake in the veil One sacrifice was made as the heavens roll, lifted up tonight, giving praise. And all in Jesus, all in Lord of heaven and earth, all in King Jesus.
People looking in from the outside just look at the behavior and they're just almost flabbergasted. But over a long period of time, that turns into a bitterness and in some cases almost rage at the behavior and what it's doing to their lives, their friends, their businesses. As a recovering alcoholic myself, I've been on the other side of the fence. I was 46 years old. I had lost my job. My marriage was in trouble uh, and I asked for help uh, and ended up going to a rehab facility. I got to know Jesus during that process, developed a relationship with him, experienced his grace, and by his power, I've now been sober for almost 13 years. Well, a lot of people have heard about 12-step programs and what they involve. I'm asked to deal with my past, try to clean up my street the best I can, and it all culminates with the 12th step where I am asked to take the gift that I have been given and to share that with other people. The most destructive thing in an alcoholic's life is bitterness and resentment. If somebody has done something to me, I really have two choices. I can hang on to it and try to get even, or I can step out of my own shoes into theirs and think, you know, They've got stuff going on here. How can I be of service to them instead of how can I play God and punish them? I want to give back what Jesus has given me. He has restored relationships, given me a hope. He has given me the desire to want to help people. He's given me a day at a time. I don't have to worry about two weeks, two years, two decades from now. He has given me just a purpose now where I feel like at least part of the time I'm doing what he wants, not what I want. And it's just astounding how much peace that brings. Well, I was standing in line at a grocery store in Los Angeles County, California. I was minding my own business, I really was. Not really paying attention to who was in front of me or who was behind me. I was kind of waiting, already aware that I had chosen the wrong line because whatever our line I choose is always gonna be the longest. And I'm looking at some of the magazines, looking at the headlines, wondering, can you really Get rock hard abs in three days. Like, is that, is that really in, is that article in there? But having too much pride to pick it up and flip through it, just trying to imagine what the exercise routine is that might make that happen. And suddenly there's a man that's behind me, an elderly man. I can tell by his shirt that he works at that grocery store and he starts talking to me about World War II, just kind of out of nowhere. I didn't respond to him. I didn't say anything during the entire conversation. It really wasn't a conversation because he just talked and I, I didn't. But then he started to talk about how much he hated Japanese people. Started using some vulgar language to describe them and I just kind of stepped back and I, I honestly thought, well, maybe, he's, maybe he has a mental illness of some kind. I wasn't sure what was happening, but, but he, he finally ended his little tirade by saying, those people don't deserve to live in our country. Thankfully, he walked off, and I turned around to face the young lady behind the cash register. Young Japanese girl, couldn't have been more than 20. I filled with tears. I'm so sorry. I said, I'm so sorry. And she wiped away some tears and she, she said, that's okay. But it wasn't, wasn't okay. She knew that, I knew that, you know that. It's like, it's not okay that those people, that approach, that those people approach to life is not okay. 
And yet if we're honest, I, I think we would have to say that some of us have some of those people, people that um, are different than us and we're not sure what to do with or what category to put them in. And so we just keep our distance from them and, and maybe we don't say anything about them publicly, but they're different than us. They dress different or they vote different. I mean, increasingly, I mean, you know this, but increasingly disagreement requires dislike. And if you don't dislike someone you disagree with, then the people you agree with feel like you don't like them and, and it's all just become very tribal. So there's lots more categories of those people than I think there's ever been before. Those people, for some, some of us, are, are people who not just look different, not just vote different, but people who sin different. And they don't do what you do and you don't do what they do. Like they struggle with something different than you, you do. You know those people. Their sins are a little bit more obvious, a little bit more um, out there, those people. And for some of you, those people are people who treat you like those people. And if you're gonna treat me like those people, well, then you're gonna be those people to me. Like that's our, pro those people for some of us are the people who owe us, they owe us something. They owe you money or they owe you a marriage or they owe you a childhood, or at least an explanation. They owe you an explanation, at least that. You know those people. And so we start to have this bitterness and this resentment in our hearts, and when that's a blind spot, it almost always grows out of proportion. Like it starts small, but when bitterness gets left unchecked, it ends up making a scene at the grocery store that's awkward for everybody. Like it just, it just goes further than we meant for it to go. It's the way hate works. The Bible says in Hebrews, don't let the root of bitterness grow in you. There's something about bitterness that if it takes root, it takes over. And so we wanna, we wanna check our blind spot here. We wanna specifically check the blind spot of bitterness. We're gonna study together an Old Testament book called Jonah. And Jonah is probably a name you recognize if you grew up in church or even if you didn't. And, but you, Think about Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the great fish as the Bible talks about. But really the story of Jonah is a story of a man who God wants to use, but he's just blinded by bitterness. He doesn't see it, but bitterness in his life has just become more important to him than doing what God's asked him to do. So we're gonna study together the, the book of Jonah. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, I was in the Holy Land. I took a, a trip with about a dozen other guys and, and we did a hundred mile hike through the Holy Land. It was not really a tourist thing. It was more of like a, 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 a hike. It was like a pilgrimage, sp spiritual pilgrimage through the Holy Land. It was a really powerful time for me. But we, we get there, and the very first night we were there, we spent the night in um, an area called, uh, or what's called, Joppa. And I knew about Joppa, studied that in scripture growing up, but, but I didn't know we were gonna be staying there the first night. And, and so we were in Joppa, and that night we walked down to this port, it's really the only port in Joppa. I've got a picture of myself uh, here. It's, that's really me. Like it looks totally photoshopped, but that's not photoshopped. Like that's, that's me, the port of Joppa. Now if every picture I took looked that exact way, I would get skeptical, uh, but, but that's the only one that kind of turned out that way. And, and so Joppa is um, right outside Tel Aviv. It's, it's on the coast there um, of the Mediterranean Sea. And we spent the night in Joppa and I stood on the shore there and I just kind of watched the waves come in. And I thought about this sermon because Joppa is the port where Jonah stood when he was trying to decide, am I gonna do what God wants me to do? Or am I gonna run away from him? Like that's, that was where he boarded the ship to run away from God. So, so I was standing on that coast, just imagining the decision in his life. He knows what God's asked of him. He knows what God's told him, but he just, he just can't do it. He disobeys God, but why does he disobey God? I remember as a kid, I heard the story and whoever taught me the story, I guess in Sunday school with some flannel graph, I would imagine, said the reason, the reason why Jonah didn't go to Nineveh because he was afraid of public speaking, didn't want to be a public speaker. No, that's not true. Like that wasn't the issue. It's that he hated the Ninevites. It was bitter towards those people. Jonah chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Remember that phrase, word of the Lord. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah probably thought, well, you think? It's about, it's about time. 
Do you know what those people have done to our people, to your people? And so God says to Jonah, I want you to go and I want you to preach against them. And so the assignment, here's Jonah, he's in Joppa and he's to go to Nineveh. Let's put that up on a map. It's about, you know, 550 miles away. That's the journey that he's to take to preach. That's in, to give you some context here, that's in uh, modern day Iraq or Northern Iraq. Nineveh at the time was the capital of Assyria and God calls it here a great city. Great doesn't mean really good. Great means powerful, but they were a violent, violent city. They didn't just conquer a nation, they practiced genocide. And Assyrians, um, their uh, engravings of, of this time in history where Assyrians, people in Nineveh would capture these images of their enemies being tortured impaled, uh, they would use the skulls of their enemy for enemies for decorations. And Israel was one of their enemies. So Jonah knows not only what the people of Nineveh have done in the past, but he knows what they might still do in the future. And in fact, what 100 plus years later will do in wiping out the Northern Kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes. Jonah, Jonah knows this, he has this in his, his heart and his mind, he's been taught, his parents taught him, I could probably, his grandparents taught him. We don't like those people. We don't like those, we don't have anything to do with those people. Nahum would talk about the people of Nineveh, talks about the violence of those people. In Nahum chapter three, woe to Nineveh, woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, piles of dead bodies, bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses. City of blood. And so imagine being a Jew in 1940 and God saying, you know what? Would you go to Germany? I want you to preach to the Nazis. See how that goes. And Jonah was given a very clear direction by God. Now, most of us would say, that's all we really want from God. I mean, if you, if you ask me what's the most important people or most important question people have for God, I would say that generally speaking, over the years, the question people really have for God is, God, what do you want me to do? What's your will for my life? What do you want me to do? When do you want me to do it? Where do you want me to go? Just give me some directions. And we tend to not be very satisfied with the general will of God. Like we're looking for GPS. We want some coordinates. And Jonah gets it. Here, here's what I want you to do. Here's where I want you to go. And yet he is just blinded by, by bitterness. And bitterness when it's in your blind spot, it might look small, but it gets bigger quickly. It comes up on you faster than you expect it to. And if left unchecked, it, it, it'll always run you off the road. And so maybe, you're, um, maybe your parents divorced, divorced when you were young and, and they put you in an impossible situation and you're like 11 years old trying to decide who you're supposed to live with. And, and there's manipulation and there is bitterness and resentment and you start to feel that and, and you thought you were over that. You told yourself, when I look, when, when I'm out, I'm out of that house. I'm putting that behind me. And, and yet as much as you don't want to admit it, you've carried some of that into your marriage and into your relationship with your spouse and some of that bitterness overflows to your kids. If it goes unchecked, it just gets bigger. But You think it'll go away but the blind spot of bitterness just grows, becomes even more blinding. Or maybe your dad was absent from your life during some of your growing up years. And, and so for a while, you got a card on your birthday and then it turned into a phone call and then it turned into nothing. And, and you tried to make excuses for him and you pretended like you didn't care and you, you tried to bury your bitterness under apathy, but, but it's still there. Maybe a promise was made to you on your wedding day and the promise was supposed to be permanent, but then you found the text messages and with each text message you read, the bitterness began to build. Or you prayed that she would get better. Like how many nights you, you stayed on your knees beside her hospital bed, but she didn't get better, she got worse. And, and so these prayers of worship turned into angry accusations, turned into silent bitterness and you don't even know the last time that you've prayed. Or you had a best friend who knew everything about you. They knew everything about you because you told your best friend everything about you. And then the rumors, 
and, and then the behind the back comments and betrayal and now bitterness tells you, you don't ever do that again and, it, and you carry it into every relationship you have. It's the way bitterness works. It, it creates a blind spot that, that begins to determine your path. So who are, who are those people? where you're carrying around some of that bitterness, some of that resentment, some of that hatred. I mean, Jonah could have probably put together a pretty compelling case as to why he felt the way that he did. And you very likely could as well. He stands at the port of Joppa. He knows what God wants, but his bitterness just blinds him. And verse three says, so Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Headed for Tarshish. Tarshish is fun to say. I, I, I don't know if you're this way. There's, probably not. But when I sit and listen to a preacher say a word that's fun to say, I, I want to say it. And then I'll just think about it during the sermon. I'm like, Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. Let me, get, let me help you get that out of your system. So we're just gonna say Tarshish. One, two, three, Tarshish. It's fun. So he heads to Tarshish. Let me put this back on a map. Nineveh, modern day Iraq. Tarshish, Spain. Like he goes 25 or begins to go 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Like he's not just hiding, he's, he is running away, he's running away from God. He goes towards Tarshish. And his bitterness is rooted in the fact that he thinks the people of Nineveh are those people, but he doesn't understand that he is those people, meaning that his accusation against Nineveh is what? They are rebellious against God. Oh, and, and what are you again? Because didn't he tell you to go here and you're going there? You, you see what I mean? Like Jonah, by doing this, was showing that he's those people and we're all those people. There's a story on um, NPR some time ago about the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Apparently back in the 70s, they had a, a gift shop that kept losing money, like quite a bit of money, 150000 ish dollars a year was missing in cash and merchandise, and they didn't know where it was going. That's like 40% at that time is 40% of their profits were just disappearing. And, and so this gift shop at the Kennedy Center, they, they hire a, a detective. His name is uh, Detective Loveless which sounds like the name of a detective on Law and Order. But he comes in and he begins to try to find out, okay, who's, who's taking the merchant? Who's taking this money? But a lot of people worked at that gift shop. And there were managers and there were part-time workers and there were retirees who wanted to work at the Kennedy Center and just get a little extra income on the side. There were even volunteers who wanted to support the arts. So there's a lot of people that were a part of it. And so Detective Loveless thought, well, let's just start with the guy who takes the cash to the bank. Let's just get him off the list. Let's start with him. And so without that guy knowing it, of course, uh, Detective Loveless took some money, some marked bills, and he put them in there. And then they waited. And then after he went to the bank to make the deposit, they tackle him. And he's got $60 of the money that's in his pocket. $60. Well, $150,000, that's a, that's a slow way to get it, right? So they think, okay, well, he's stealing $60, but that doesn't really explain all the other money and all the other merchandise that's been missing. And so they kept working at it and trying to figure out where all this money and all this merchandise is going. Detective Loveless kept detecting. And you know what he found out? You know who he found out was stealing? Did you hear the story? Everybody. He found out everybody was stealing. That's why the story was being told. I mean, volunteers would steal a shirt. I'm volunteering, of course I can take a shirt. Part-time workers take a little bit of money for cab fare. They're not paying me enough to get here and back, so it's fine, I'll just take a little bit. Nobody's gonna notice it's gone. Manager borrows a little bit of cash with the full intent of at some point paying it back keeping an IOU going in his mind. Everybody, everybody was stealing. And this is the message of the gospel. Like, who's doing it? Oh, it's everybody. Who's running from God? Everybody. 
Everybody runs. Everybody. And when you understand that it's everybody, that means there's not those people. It's just all y'all. It's just all of us. It's everybody. And when you understand it's everybody, it doesn't leave a lot of room for bitterness and resentment because there's not categories of people. It's just everybody. That everybody has run from God. It's everybody. We are all those people. Brene Brown, in her talk on vulnerability, talks about this, and she uses this language. She says, we are all those people. That's the truth. Most of us are one paycheck, one divorce, one drug-addicted kid, one mental health diagnosis, one serious illness, one sexual assault, one drinking binge, one night of unprotected sex, or one affair away from being those people, the ones we don't trust, the ones we pity, the ones we don't let our children play with, the ones bad things happen to, the ones we don't want living next door. She says, we're all, we're all those people. We are all the people who ignore the hurts of others. As long as our needs are taken care of, we're good. We are all the people who maybe yell at each other on the way to church and then get out and pretend everything's good and everything's okay. We are all the people who think somehow God loves us more because we don't do what that person did. We're all the people who've taken God's seat and decided it's our job to judge others self-righteously. We're all the people who who gossip and mur murmur and feel better about ourselves by assuming the worst in others. We're all those people. We are all people whose pride causes us to be easily offended and always defensive. We're all those kinds of people who spend hours a day trying to convince other people that our lives are better than theirs. We're, we're all the people who, who lose control and yell and call names or punch a hole in the wall. Like we're all those people. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, I'm not those people, yeah, you are, because you don't think you're those people, that makes you those people, because you've got this pride, the spirit of self-righteousness that puts you in the category of those people. And Jonah is filled with bitterness, and his bitterness, what's it do? It takes him 2,500 miles away from where God wanted him to go. It's what bitterness does. If left unchecked, it will always take your life in a direction that's different than the life God wanted you to have. That's what bitterness does. And you might have a case to make, and maybe, I don't know what was done to you, maybe you tell me what was done to you as if your resentment is justified and you get to live this way the rest of your life. You've, you somehow deserve that. But how's that, how's that work for you? Yeah, I, I heard someone define bitterness as, how'd it go? Um, setting yourself on fire, hoping the smoke will bother somebody. Like it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And he gets on a ship and he heads to Tarshish, verse four. Then the Lord sent a violent wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose so that the ship threatened to break up and all the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God, little g God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So Jonah Jonah says no to God, and then God sends a storm. Like, God doesn't just say, oh, so you're out? Okay, Nahum, let's go. Let's see what you got. You're in the game. Like, no, like, God goes after Jonah. Jonah disobeyed, but follow this. His disobedience doesn't disqualify him. God still wants to use him. It, it, the act of disobedience doesn't disqualify him from what God wanted him to do. And so God, he runs, but God, God goes after him. Now, how does God go after him? Listen, he goes by sending a storm. That's how God chases him down, is he sends a storm. And if you've been on the run from God and you find yourself surrounded by a storm, be careful that you're not assuming that storm is somehow evidence that God has abandoned you. It may be the best evidence that God is chasing you. He's not gonna make it easy for you to just turn and run from him. He comes after you, and sometimes a storm is filled with grace and mercy. Some of you know that. You could give that testimony. Verse five says that there was a great storm, but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell asleep into a deep, fell into a deep sleep. And the captain, like he can't believe Jonah's sleeping, he says to Jonah, how can you sleep? And the captain says to Jonah, get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we won't perish. The captain says, look, if you get up and cry out to God, maybe, he'll, maybe he will have compassion on us. I don't know. It's worth, it. it's worth a try. Why don't you get up and call on your God? And the sea keeps getting worse. The sailors are 
trying to figure out what's happening. Like they start to realize there's something supernatural about this storm. And verse nine, Jonah says, fellas, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord God. Like I know y'all worship little G gods. I actually worship the one and only God, the same, the same God who made the, the sea. Yeah, that's the God I worship. And the sailors are like, wait, you got on a boat to try and run from the God who made the sea? <laughs> the soldiers, or the sailors rather, are terrified and they ask Jonah what they should do. Verse 12, pick me up, Jonah says, and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this is a great storm, that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, O Lord, they're praying to the real God now. O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah, and they threw him overboard, and the raging seas grew calm. And that's kind of the part of the story that most people are familiar with. Jonah and, the, Jonah and the whale, and the whale's name is Monstro, and he's running away from Geppetto, and more than anything else, he wants to be a real boy. Like, the, like the, 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 we get it confused in our minds because it feels a little, it feels a little fairy tale-ish. But, but read it carefully. Verse 17, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. God, it says God provided, it doesn't say well, it says God provided this this fish. Now I've preached to people and I've talked to people who see something like this and they just roll their eyes. Like you really, you, you believe that you believe that. Yeah. I don't even think it was that hard for him. Like I think it was actually pretty easy for God. If you look around at the rest of the universe, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Besides think of the arrogance, think of, the, think of the arrogance of this. We as humans, have built submarines that take groups of people under the sea for four to six months at a time submerged. Like we can do that, but God making a fish that would allow someone to survive for three days and three nights, God, I, can't, I can't believe that. I just think of the, the arrogance of refusing to allow for it. Chapter two begins with um, Jonah's in the great fish. God sent the great fish just to capture him, scoop him up. God's real careful with his instructions, like says to the great fish, this is really important. Swallow, but don't chew. Like that's, <laughs> it's not in there, but uh, I, he probably did specify that. Chapter two, verse one. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. And from the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. And so here Jonah is doing something we haven't seen him do yet. See, he prays. And he worships God, the God who saves. Chapter two, verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Sometimes God saves you, but it's kind of gross. Like sometimes God rescues you, but you don't smell that good, right? Like it, it's not pretty, but God rescues him. Verse one of chapter three, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah, let's try this again. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came a second time. And there's really good news here for all of you who are trying to ride out the storm and it just keeps getting worse. The word of the Lord is coming again. The word of the Lord is coming again. You don't have to respond this time the way you did last time. Verse three, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. The word of the Lord came, Jonah says yes. I don't know how many times it's been for you, but I believe the word of the Lord is coming again to you today. I, and I believe you don't have to respond this time the way you responded last time. It's, it's not too late to say yes. And so Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he preaches this message to the Ninevites, in 40 days the city will be destroyed. And he really doesn't want to preach the message. He, he wants it to, that city, he wants it to be wiped off the map. So I'm guessing he's not preaching very hard, not putting a lot of time into his messages. 
Chapter three, verse six says, though when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. And the king issued a decree for every living creature to fast from food. Verse eight says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Let them repent. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so the king repents and he calls all the people to repent And he tells the people, it's time to change. It's time for us to call upon the Lord, to humble ourselves. Maybe God will have compassion on us. And here's what God does, verse 10. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. Another version says he had compassion on them and he did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. And that feels like it should be the end of the story. Okay, okay. Well, that's kind of beautiful, depending on whether or not you think you're those people. That they repent, they humble themselves, God has compassion on them, but that's, that's not the end of the story. Chapter four is a weird chapter. It's a weird way. If you're a storyteller, it's a weird way to end any kind of story. So God does all of this, and then chapter four begins, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. So here's what Jonah's doing, and this is where bitterness takes us. He's saying to God, I'll sit where you're sitting. I'm gonna take your seat, and I'm gonna judge, and I'm gonna determine what they deserve and what they have coming. He takes, bitterness makes you wanna take the seat of God. It's It's not Jonah's seat, but he feels like it's not fair. Verse two, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said? When I was at home, I told you this would happen. I knew you were gonna do this. That's why I tried to to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. It sounds at first like he's, it's like a worship song. You're slow to anger, you're abounding in love. This is an accusation. Why? Because it's not for him. It's for those people. And he's not okay with that. There are two prayers that Jonah prays in the book of Jonah. One of them is in the belly of the fish where he praises God for being compassionate and merciful. The other one is where he's angry and bitter to God for being compassionate and merciful. He wanted it for himself, but not for those people. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? It's a good question. Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city and there he made himself a shelter and he sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's hoping destruction, but he doesn't have much confidence that God's gonna do that. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Really, just really kind But at dawn, and so Jonah was very happy about that plant, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, first a whale, then a worm, first a great fish, then a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind so that the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, he wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, I'm so angry I wish I were dead. So unattractive, this bitterness. Like when you see it from somebody who's received it, it's just, ugh. Like when, when you know somebody has been given what they didn't deserve and they don't want others to get what they don't deserve. And, and he, he's complaining about the plant. But the Lord said, look, you've been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. You didn't, have anything, you didn't have anything to do with it. You just received it. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? The end. That's it. That's the story. Jonah, angry, bitter. God saying, Should I not be concerned about the people and the cows? The end. What happens? I don't know. I I don't know. 
For Jonah, it seems like that's where bitterness left him, but that's not where it has to leave you. I don't know that story, but I know your story is still being written. I, I was looking for a better story to end this with, and I was uh, rereading Corey Tinboom tell the story of living the horrors of the concentration camp in Nazi Germany. But I never read her first person account of this event. The Nazi jailers had, had brutalized her and her sister, Betsy, at, at uh, Ravensbrück. And Corey watched while they were there as her sister withered away and died under the Nazi abuse. And Corey survived. And after the war, she became an evangelist where she traveled around uh, preaching about Jesus and preaching about forgiveness in Germany, by the way. She writes about preaching in Munich, Germany in 1947 after the message, there was a man that worked his way up to the front and instantly she recognized him. It was a guard from Ravensbrück. Here's how she writes about that moment. I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filling or filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture when I preached that when we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean. They are gone forever, forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence and silence collected their wraps and silence left the room. And that's when I saw him working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, and the next in my mind, I could see him in a blue uniform and a cap with skull and crossbones in a huge room with its harsh overhead lights and a pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor and the shame of walking past this man while I was naked. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath her parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. And now he's in front of me, his hand thrust out. A fine message. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. She says, and I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. And now I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. He said, I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he said, I have become a Christian and I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Again, his hand extended, will you forgive me? I stood there. I whose sins had again and again been forgiven, but could not forgive Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking for forgiveness? It couldn't have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have hurt us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you yours. I knew it, not, was, it was not only a command of God, but I knew it as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had opened up a home in Holland for victims of na Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. But those who nursed their bitterness, she writes, remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I thought, I can do that much. God, you supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched in front of me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried. 
with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard, the former prisoner. She concludes, I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Different than Jonah chapter four. What you have to decide is how your story is gonna end. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would help all of us recognize that we are those people. It's everybody. And that you have forgiven us and we didn't deserve it and we didn't earn it and we're no more worthy of it than anyone else. And I pray, God, that the grace that you have given us freely would flow out of our hearts and lives onto the people around us. God, would you forgive us for the bitterness that we've held on to? We listen to a story like that with Corey Ten Boom, and, and yet I know there's still people in this, this room, people listening to this, that just, like, if, if, if somebody pressured them to forgive someone who had said something bad about them, who hurt them 10 years ago, or, or it would just be too much. It would just say, well, it's just too hard. But God, harder things have been done. Like when you, Jesus, died on the cross for our sins, and I know I'm talking to some people who have been hurt beyond what I can imagine. And I know that they are owed something. They deserve something. But God, you, you love them and you have forgiven them freely. And I pray that they would bask in that and it would just overflow out of them, not out of their own power or strength, but that they would extend their hand and they would experience and they would know your love in a way that they've never known it before. So I don't know what needs to happen before the end of this day. Maybe it's a text, maybe it's a text. Or maybe it's a phone call or maybe it's stopping by somebody's house. Maybe it involves the word, I, words, I know it's been a long time, but I, I just pray God that you would allow us as your followers to be known as people of grace and compassion and forgiveness. That's who you are and that's who you have called us to be. It's in your name we pray, amen. that you